So good morning, everyone. I'm Mansi Prabhavalkar. Uh, I have a very complicated last name, but Ken, thank you so much for pronouncing it properly. Uh, so today I'm here to talk about OpenStack at scale inside NetApp. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working as a systems architect at NetApp for the past two years now. I basically deal with all things OpenStack. So before this, I was pursuing my master's degree in computer science from NC State University. Uh, this is my first job ever, and I get to do OpenStack things, so I'm very much loving my job right now. Uh, so, okay, there is a disconnect between these two. Yeah, sorry about that. So at NetApp, I work as a part of the Engineering Shared Infrastructure Services Organization, or ESIS. So as the name suggests, we are responsible for providing engineering resources to our NetApp engineers to test our products against. Uh, we, we try to be the customer zero for our own products, and so we try to be at the bleeding edge of technology by implementing every new cool and awesome thing that is out there. This enables us to test our products against the various different ecosystems that our customers might deploy at their premises. So, Today I'm here to share our journey and experience with OpenStack for the past two years. Back in 2013, our engineering organization implemented our very own internal private cloud called the Global Engineering Cloud. So up until 2014, we just had two primary hypervisors, which were VMware and Hyper-V. But in 2014, we decided to make a strategic decision to implement OpenStack in our engineering premises. We wanted our products to be tested against the most widely deployed um, environments at our customer's place, and so we wanted OpenStack as a part of our GEC portfolio. So in August 2014, we implemented our very own Juno OpenStack environment with uh, 45 compute nodes at our local site in RTP North Carolina. Since then, we have achieved some major milestones in our journey, those being uh, deploying and automating OpenStack deployments using Puppet Open Source Tool, uh, then automating OpenStack upgrades from the Juno to Kilo release of OpenStack at our local site in RTP North Carolina. Going ahead and globalizing OpenStack and spreading the awesomeness across the other different engineering sites that we have at NetApp. Doing global non-disruptive upgrades of all of our sites to the newer Liberty release. And then I'm going to conclude with some of our future plans with OpenStack in GEC. So to give you an overview of our global engineering cloud, it is a homegrown internal private cloud. At the front end, it has a self-service web portal, which serves as a one-stop location for all of our users to request for engineering resources. At the back end, it is a multi-hypervisor environment with uh, VMware, Hyper-V, and the recent addition of KVM on OpenStack. So we don't really use the OpenStack dashboard for now, but we uh, do use the OpenStack functionality as the back end as one of the hypervisors. So as of today, our cloud can support 75,000 total instances, out of which 15% are currently residing on KVM. We are uh, ramping up efforts to increase our footprint in OpenStack, and we are predicting that by September 2018, we'll be around 70% on KVM, thanks to our success with OpenStack uh, inside our GEC environment. Also, we are all about bleeding edge technology, so we have chosen the RDO open source distribution for OpenStack. Today, we are, uh, we, we are uh, running the latest Metaka RDO release, which is housed on top of a FlexPod data center foundation. FlexPod is nothing but an integrated solution of storage, network, and compute. It consists of NetApp E-Series, or fast storage, with Cisco Nexus networking and Cisco UCS compute. In terms of automation, uh, we use Puppet open source. Uh, we also use CI CD tools like Jenkins and Git for version control. So now let's talk OpenStack. Uh, we have adopted the regions architecture for OpenStack. Regions are nothing but their own deployment of OpenStack with a shared authentication service and a shared dashboard. So we have pulled out the Keystone and Horizon components and housed them in a shared region that we call as region zero. We have made them highly available by spreading them across three different hosts and putting them behind a pair of active passive HA proxy load balancers. Also, our Region Zero has a highly available Galera DB environment that hosts all the shared databases in our region, uh, in our architecture. These shared databases are Keystone, Glance, Cinder, and Heat. Uh, so our Nova region is stamped out with a controller node that hosts the remaining services of OpenStack. 
a database node that houses the NOVA and Neutron databases for that particular region, a MongoDB node for the Silometer component, and a cluster of 15 compute nodes. So each of our regions are stamped out with its own NOVA compute capacity and a slash 22 Neutron subnet, giving us a VM capacity of 1,000 instances per region. This model allows us to scale, uh, scale out or scale up by either adding more regions to the environment or by adding more compute nodes within each region. Also, this model gives us different failure domains. So if for some reason one region goes down, still there are uh, other active regions that, that can take over OpenStack deployments. In terms of storage, uh, all of the compute nodes within each region are backed by the same shared NetApp NFS backend. This uh, allows us to easily live migrate VMs within each region, and it greatly helps us while doing our live upgrades in OpenStack. Also, all the region controllers are backed by the same shared NetApp NFS backend for image service. Uh, this allows us to add one image in region one, which gets automatically visible in all other regions in our environment. So our major reason why we chose regions architecture was to be as close to our VMware and Hyper-V environments as possible in GEC. Uh, a VMware cluster or a Hyper-V cluster of 15 compute nodes is similar to a region in OpenStack. This strategy greatly allowed, us, uh, allowed our operations team to, be more, uh, to do a more smooth transition to OpenStack and welcoming it as a, uh, and embrace it as a new change in our GEC portfolio. So, now let's talk about automating OpenStack deployments. Our automation takes place in two phases, which are hardware and software automation. The hardware automation takes place on the FlexPod side of things, and it consists of three steps. First step is to create VLANs for the OpenStack guests. This involves using some homegrown automation on the Cisco Nexus switches that we had already devised for our VMware and Hyper-V environments. Step two is to create, use NetApp's Flex clone technology to create uh, volumes for Cinder, Nova, and uh, image services for OpenStack. And step three is prepping the nodes by adding them, uh, by assigning them a bootlun uh, for SAN booting and also assigning them a service profile in Cisco UCS. Now, once the nodes are prepped, they are fed to our Puppet Master, and then the Puppet automation takes over. Our Puppet Master consists of eight different roles that describe all of the different types of nodes in our architecture. These roles are uh, Keystone, Web, Galera DB, and Load Balancer roles from Region 0, and Controller, Compute, Database, and MongoDB roles from the NOVA regions. So each of our nodes go through these two phases of automation and get, uh, and get configured for a Keystone uh, component or a controller or a co compute node. And then finally, they give us a production-ready OpenStack environment with NetApp NFS backend. So first, we, uh, when we first went live with OpenStack, we were on the Juno release, and um, we had 45 compute nodes. Thanks to the Puppet automation, we just spent like 90 minutes to spin up an uh, entire production-ready OpenStack environment in GEC. Now that we had successfully uh, deployed OpenStack using Puppet automation, we wanted to use a similar automation strategy for non-disruptive upgrades as well. We wanted to come up with an upgrade plan that was automated, non-disruptive, and uh, repeatable between different OpenStack releases. OpenStack has a rapidly evolving cadence, and we wanted to keep up with all the new releases and all the new goodness that uh, each release has to offer. Uh, we also wanted our existing VMs to work so that our end users do not suffer any downtime when we actually upgrade our environments. So, as I discussed earlier, we already had a modular architecture, which greatly helped us to create our very own upgrade strategy plan. Uh, it involved tackling each of the segments one at a time. We started off with shared services, which had the Keystone and Horizon components. First, we upgraded the Keystone service serially in order to maintain service continuity. Also, after the upgrade, the upgraded Keystone continued to work with all the previous release components, thanks to backwards compatibility in OpenStack. Once Keystone was done, we moved on to Horizon, and we also upgraded it serially to maintain service continuity. Once the shared services were done, it was time for the region controllers, uh, and we upgraded them in serial manner as well. So during the upgrade, even when the region went down, still the VMs continued to work as they were residing on the compute nodes, making it non-disruptive for our existing end users. Also, if any new requests came in during that time, those were routed to the other active regions, making it non-disruptive for our new end users as well. Now it was time for the most important upgrade, which was the compute part. Uh, we had three regions with 15 compute nodes each, 
So we took the first compute node in each region, live migrated all of the VMs off it, and only when it was empty, we upgraded it to the next OpenStack release. Thus our, um, uh, thus our compute upgrade was serially within a region, but in parallel across the different regions in the environment. Thanks to our uh, upgrade strategy and powered automation, it just took us four hours to upgrade our entire environment with 45 compute nodes and 1,000 active VMs with zero service interruption to our end users. Now let's talk about globalization. Uh, by the end of 2015, we already had a local OpenStack environment that we deployed and had successfully upgraded. We were a year in production now, and our operations team was very much familiar with OpenStack, and they were confident enough to support it on a daily basis. We were constantly documenting everything that we were learning and refining our puppet automation in order to incorporate those lessons. And so we decided that it was time for us to go big. We are a global organization, and we wanted to expand the scope of OpenStack globally as well. So in December 2015, we brought up three more OpenStack environments at each of our other engineering sites, which were Bangalore, India, Sunnyvale, California, and another smaller site in RTP, North Carolina. We were still on the Kilo release, and uh, we were doing some training sessions to bring our global peers up to speed with the newer OpenStack environment. And by December, it was time for the stable Liberty release to come out, and so we wanted to do an entire global upgrade of our environment to the newer Liberty release. Thanks to our uh, operations team and also our previous successful experience with uh, upgrading OpenStack, we were able to do that in just less than a week. Now, to just give you an overview about the scale of our OpenStack environment, the two smaller environments uh, are in Bangalore and the other one is in California with 100 VM capacity and 600 VM capacity. These were like starter environments to uh, get people more familiar and on board with OpenStack, and we are trying to increase our footprint of OpenStack over there. The two bigger environments are uh, locally in RTP North Carolina with a 2,000 VM capacity and 6,000 VM capacity. So as of today, we uh, have around 9,000 to 10,000 VMs on OpenStack. Our OpenStack journey has been nothing but enriching, and we have learned a lot along the way. Uh, we have learned that OpenStack is complex, but it is maturing. Our experience with Kilo to Liberty upgrade was very much smoother than the previous Juno to Kilo upgrade. Also, we are uh, always documenting stuff so that we can come up with best practices for our own environments, uh, depending on our workloads. Second is you should always set your expectations right with OpenStack. It is not a product. It is a collection of projects. And there are a thousand different ways to uh, deploy your own OpenStack environment and a thousand different tools that you can deploy it with. So you should come up with your own strategy and your own architecture, which is suitable for your use case and your workloads in the environment. And also, storage is very much important. And that app storage played a very important role in uh, deployments and upgrades of OpenStack. It allowed us to live migrate VMs, uh, which made our live upgrades successful. Uh, being a part of the FlexPod Foundation, it was easier for us to scale compute as we scaled our OpenStack cloud. And thanks to our NetApp Cinder driver, instance creation was 50% faster than the generic NFS Cinder driver. Some recommendations for you would be number one, your underlying infrastructure. Uh, your cloud is only as good as the infrastructure that is underneath. So for us, FlexPod made the most sense because it is a reference architecture that has been around for a couple of years, and it has been tried and tested over and over again. It is highly available, highly resilient, and it allows you to independently scale storage, network, and compute pieces. Also, monitoring should be a very integral part of all of your uh, OpenStack deployments because it allows you to evaluate your architecture and enables you to make better scaling decisions. Second would be automation. Uh, you should always use automation for deploying and upgrading OpenStack environments as they are very much complex and uh, there are a lot of moving parts. Also, um, for us, the automation and non-disruptive upgrades were what uh, made our OpenStack environment successful in GEC. And third would be support and operations. Uh, OpenStack is very much difficult to manage, and uh, so it is necessary to do, uh, to do all the necessary steps to educate and mentor your peers and bring them up to speed with OpenStack. At NetApp, we frequently have training sessions that take place globally. We also have OpenStack discussions so that everyone is always on the same page with our OpenStack strategy. Now where we are going next, there are a lot many exciting new projects in the OpenStack community, but the ones that make most sense for our use case are the, uh, the Ironic project, which is bare metal as a service. 
Currently, we just offer virtualized resources to our users, and we want to expand our scope to bare metal resources as well using the Ironic project. Also, there is Trove. Uh, I heard a lot many interesting sessions yesterday, and looks like Trove is very much ready for production. DB servers are very popular in our engineering environment, and we cannot wait to get Trove into production as soon as possible. The other two projects uh, are Manila, which is FileShare as a service, and Magnum, which is Container as a service. We are currently evaluating them in our dev environment and are going to go with production uh, with them very, very soon. And this is the last slide. I don't want to eat up much of your break time. <laughs> so the key takeaways from our experience would be, number one, have a good foundation that you can count on. OpenStack framework is highly scalable, and Flexpod gives you a flexible architecture that, keep up with the, that can keep up with the changing needs of an OpenStack environment. Second would be set your expectations right, uh, plan well, and document well. This is very important because OpenStack has a rapidly evolving cadence, and you should always have to be on top of things to uh, make sure that you're successful in your OpenStack environments. And last but not the least, uh, thanks to all the trials and tribulations that we went through with OpenStack, today our global engineering cloud is backed by an OpenStack ecosystem that is uh, highly available upgradable between different OpenStack releases and provided at scale across various geographical regions. Some collateral that is out there for OpenStack and uh, Flexpod. Uh, the most recent one is Flexpod with OSP8 platform. You guys can find this useful. And thank you very much. I hope I didn't take much of your time. Yeah. Thank you.